Welcome to Pacific Mammal Researchers Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Welcome to the Pac-Man Podcast. I am Cindy. And I'm Kat. And this week is a marine mammal highlight. And um, so we had the New Zealand fur seal versus the... Oh, shoot. What was the other one we had? The Ross seal. Oh, the Ross seal. That's right. Um, And it was a a fairly convincing victory. It was like 57% to 30-something or, you know, it was something like that. Um, So the New Zealand fur seal won out. So... Thank you guys for voting. Um, quite a few of you did, which was awesome. Um, and so this, we're going to be talking about the New Zealand fur seal. Um, let's start off just really quickly that it's a fur seal, but it actually is an eared seal like the sea lions. And I'm sure Kat will, will get into that a little bit. But just, just to start off with a, it's a seal, but it's not actually a seal. <laughs> not what we call a true seal. A true seal, correct. A focid. Um, so... Uh, With that, I will let Kat get into what they look like and where they are. Yeah, so let's start with what they look like first, I guess, since we're already talking about that. So like you said, they are part of the family Odoriidae. So that means that they have the external ear flaps and they can rotate their hips under their body. So instead of shuffling along like like a little worm, like true seals or phocid seals do, these guys literally can rotate the hips underneath their body and kind of waddle along on the beach and they can actually go very quickly on land Um, because of that they're surprisingly quick Um, i always like to tell when i'm talking to kids i'm like so if you were on land and a predator was coming after you which would you rather be a seal or an eared seal and a seal because they can move a little bit faster (laughs) run away um so in terms of like most people are familiar with a california sea lion so if you imagine that sort of rotation of the hips underneath that's kind of what we're talking about here um for the new zealand fur seals they are typically a dark brown to a dark gray they have a slightly lighter underside um, and they can look almost black when they're wet so these guys especially they have two layers of fur which we'll get into why this is important a little bit later on in threats and kind of a little bit of that history um so they have that kind of nice undercoat and then the dense, thicker layer um, outer coat, which is especially dense in males around the neck area. Um, and in terms of male and female differences in color, females do tend to be lighter than males, so they can appear almost silvery in color. Um, yeah, while the males typically are darker and have kind of a lighter muzzle area. Um and they have long pale whiskers, which is quite um, helpful for identification if you're trying to determine what you're seeing if you're out on the water or seeing something on land and you're not quite sure if it's a seal, the fur seal or an actual sea lion. Well, so um, both, both the males and females have like a silvery whiskers. Have the long mm-hmm. pale whiskers. Yeah. Yeah. I also saw that they're, they're more pointed nose than. Yeah. yeah I was going to get to that in a second. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Um, the only thing I saw, I was like, I try not to look at the appearance when I'm going through it. That's one thing I was like, oh. Yeah. So yeah. So basically, you can if you are trying to identify between fur seals or sea lions, which are also found in the area, they do have a more pointy nose. The fur seals are slightly smaller than the sea lions that are found in this region, um, and their preference for rocky shores also differs. Where sea lions prefer the sandy beaches. So again, where you're seeing them can also be a good indicator. Um, Hopping back to male and female differences real quick, the males are almost three times heavier than the females. So they weigh in at between 90 to 150 kilos, which is about 200 to 330 pounds. That's the males. Um, They're about two and a half meters long, while the females are typically about 30 to 50 kilos, which is like 65 to 110 pounds and about one and a half meters long. So massive size difference between the males and the females, which is fairly common with a lot of the odoriads. Yeah, especially the way they reproduce, which we'll talk about. Yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, in terms of where you can find these guys, obviously the name is a little bit of a giveaway. So the New Zealand fur seal is typically found around New Zealand, but there <laughs> are um, there do seem to be two kind of geographically distinct populations. So we have the New Zealand 
population of New Zealand fur seals, which are typically found on those rocky shores around the mainland of New Zealand, kind of more concentrated on the South Island. Um, they're found in the Chatham Islands and in the Subantarctic Islands, including Macquarie Island, which is um, a pretty big research station. The second population is actually more concentrated around South and Western Australia and Tasmania. Um, and those fur seals are typically found more in the coastal waters and the offshore islands around South or Western Australia. Um, and fun fact, I did actually get to see one of these guys when I was in Western Australia. Um, we saw one when we were doing the offshore transect. So yeah, that was actually pretty neat. It was doing all kinds of weird thermoregulation poses. It looked like it was doing yoga, yoga? in the ocean. We're all like, what the heck is that? Um, you that. we thought it was a piece of trash in the water and then we came over we're like nope that's a flipper nah. it's like thermoregulated <laughs> like, by itself in the middle of the ocean maybe he was listening um, to Madonna and doing a Vogue you know maybe maybe yeah. we watched it for quite a while it was very very cool but it was by himself was, yeah just all by itself yeah. yeah um so they do when they are in these more coastal waters they do still prefer um or, well, I take that back. They are co predominantly coastal, but when they're in the offshore waters, they prefer the continental shelf and yeah. slope when they're out to sea. Um, and I, I'm sure we'll talk about why that is in relation to prey in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but just to be clear too, while these there are these kind of geographical population separations, they do have some genetic differences, but because they are so morphologically similar, mm. at the moment, they are still fast as one single species. We'll see as we go over the next few years as genetics you know, advance more and more if that ends up getting split into two perhaps subpopulations or subspecies, who knows. Um, but currently they are viewed as one, the same species with these two geographically distinct populations. So more like ecotypes, kind of like we have with other things. Kind of, except yeah. it doesn't seem that they necessarily have a lot of specialization in different niches in those. Right, areas. they just so again, physically. Like they're, they're basically, they're very similar. They just have some slight genetic differences. So right. um, probably more similar to humans who live on, you know, different continents but they have the same lineage kind of thing right well and there, uh, there's something in the in the new research site there is something about genetics that i'll be talking about so that'll kind of perfect. key in there which will be interesting yeah perfect so that's um kind of a brief overview of where these guys so they are we are talking southern hemisphere so don't get confused when we start talking about months and seasons right um <laughs> but yeah that is the that is the new zealand fur seal appearance and distribution very cool. Yeah, when I was looking at a map, um, as I was going through different different things, it was interesting because it has, you know, all the red dots around New Zealand, like, and then they have a nice little, like, underscore around Australia, but then not mm -hmm. the top. <laughs> it's yep. just like, yeah. And just, they are typically, like I said, they are typically concentrated more around that South Island of New mm -hmm. Zealand, but it did say that they can, one of the websites that I found did say that they can be found north of Auckland as well on the North Island. Mm -hmm. So it's not restricted to the South Island by any just means. Most it's likely. common to find them down there. Yeah. Well, and they're, as I'm sure we'll get into later with the status and stuff, they're doing pretty good. So there's probably yeah. a lot of competition for space. So that's probably yeah. why you see some of them going, well, I'll try it up here. <laughs> right. Exactly. Kind of branching out a little bit more. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, we'll move right into that with the diet. So th it's kind of funny. Usually I have like a diet section and then the behavior one where we talk a bit more about like what they're doing, but pretty much everything <laughs> that there is to know about these guys is about their diet and how they behave when they're eating. So don't have, and, and reproduction. So those are really, we're really just doing like diet slash behavior and reproduction here. So, um, <clears throat> so for eating, um, they eat mostly squid and small midwater fish, but sometimes they will take larger fish like conger eels, barracuda, jack mackerel, and hokey, which I don't remember what, I remember we talked about hokey in another, another episode, but I don't remember what type of fish it is. Um, that's just a fun name. Yeah. Um, it's a white fish. A white fish. Okay. Yeah. So it's, there's a, there's a pretty, I saw that too, in relation to the threats. And so there is a pretty big fishery for mm -hmm. around New Zealand and Southern Australia. Okay. It sounds like it's a pretty common white fish in that, in that region. Okay. So yeah, that could be a, an issue if they start going after more that they're again, sometimes larger fish, like they're mainly doing the other smaller ones. Um, and we'll get into that with, with males and females uh, in a second, but uh, they did find so the main win one, they just talked about that. And then a couple of the webs uh, websites were like, they also take seabirds, like penguins. And I was like, what? What? Where? What? And then I I found that, like, it's, you know, on the sub-Antarctic islands, those ones that are, you know, most south, they'll occasionally take penguins. So just those specific regional <laughs> fur seals that are doing that. 
so interesting. Like, I wonder what the reason for that is. Like, is that a particularly poor fish year? Are they just like, you got in my way and oops? Right. Or like... <laughs> Yeah, is it something like dedicated, like I'm going to go eat that penguin, or it was like, nah, this will be something fun to do, and occasionally they right. just do it. Now, like, let me just taste it. Yeah, <laughs> so interesting. Who knows? Um, so like uh, Kat said, the reason why they're found on the continental shelf or slope is because that's where they like to feed for the most part, um, <clears throat> and they can. Um, so most of the time they're there, but they will go, as I'll talk about, up into oceanic waters, um, depending on the season. So they can dive deeper and longer than any other fur seal. So females in some areas, um, I think this is on the west coast of Australia, um, can dive deeper um, than 238 meters, which is 714 feet, if I did the math correctly. Um, I did that by hand instead of by calculator. Uh, and up to 11 minutes. So fairly deep um, and for a very long time. But most of the time, it's, it's, it's shallow, more shallow than that. Um, their prey is close to the surface at night, so it's the, the prey that kind of moves with the, the um, they go down deeper during the daytime and then come up at night, so they are almost exclusively nocturnal feeders. And they found in some studies in the summer, they dive almost continuously from sundown to sunrise. So wow. pretty intense. Yeah. yeah. Um, up to 163 meters for that one. And then the fall and winter, they dive deeper. So this is where that seasonality comes in. Sometimes dives can be, uh, many dives are over 100 meters. And they may forage up to 200 kilometers beyond the shelf in waters more than 1,000 meters deep. Yikes. That's kind of terrifying when you think about those waters and how many predators are in those waters. Like, oof. That's intense. Exactly. Like, uh, I don't want to go in, a, in that deep of water. <laughs> trying At nighttime? To like, oof. No, thank you. Um, so they do have that seasonality difference uh, in, in that and where the prey is is, is during the year. Uh, and then adult females, they found that diets tend to be generalist, which kind of makes sense because the females, as we'll talk about reproduction, they're, um, you know, lactating and pregnant and, you know, just need to get food. Uh, and so it's dictated by the prey abundance and the time constraints of being away from the pups. So we'll talk about that in a minute, but they can't spend too much time because they have to come back to nurse their pups throughout the year for the most part. Um, the adult males ate larger, more energy-rich prey, which also makes sense because they are so much larger and they need to keep that bulk. And then juveniles ate small pelagic fish around the continental shelf, uh, and they were suggesting that this is um, that they avoid competition with the adults. So um, that's good. Um, and then they also maybe can't spend as much time diving to forage on the benthic, the bottom prey, like the adults can. So there may be physical differences and then also just trying to share the food. Right. That makes yeah. sense. Um, so yeah, so the only thing with behavior I had was they live on rocky shorelines. <laughs> she already said, I'm like, okay, that's all I got. Um, yeah, everything's related to their their foraging, which I guess is most things they do. Huh. Um, so for reproduction, um, females uh, become sexually mature at four to six years of age, males at five to six years, but um, they don't get maintained territories until nine to 10. So like we were referencing before, like sea lions, they have... Um, they'll, they'll, the males will come before breeding season, a little bit before, stake out their territories, and then kind of have a harem of females that they defend during the year, or during the breeding season. Um, so they can become mature at five to six, they can do it, but they probably aren't successful until a little bit later as they can actually defend their territories. Um, they breed in the summer, which is mid-November to mid-January. Remember we're in the Southern Hemisphere? Austral summer. Right. Um, and the females will, will come a half to three days before giving birth, which for all of these wow. seals and sea lions, and it's amazing to me how, how in tune they are like, well, oh, I'm going to give birth soon. So let me get to the land. That's wild. Yeah. Like what is the physiological thing that, that goes off and says, Thank Hey, you. Yeah. Happen, right? mm -hmm. uh, and they give birth. Guess how long their labor is. Half an hour, two to seven minutes what yeah oh. i'm like i want i want a, a birth that's two to seven <laughs> minutes long <laughs> but I, I mean again like i guess it makes sense if you're living out in the wild that like the longer it is the more at risk you and the baby are so like it makes sense but yeah jealous yeah like i mean come on it's just like here <laughs> there you go <laughs> wow um but then they have to mate six to eight days after giving birth so i don't really like that part of it that's <laughs> Right. So you want it to be like as minimally traumatic as possible so that they're receptive to mating again. And like right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm like, after that, I'm like, I'm not receptive to anything right now because that was a lot. So, 
uh, but but they have to, um, and they'll even so they'll mate even before their first foraging trip. So they literally like, give birth, mate mm -hmm. again before they even go out and eat, which is kind of wow. crazy. Um, but they so the reason why they do that though is because like other sea lions um, and other fur seals, they have delayed implant and other just seals in general have delayed implantation. So they, it matches up for when they're back in breeding. So it's a nine month gestation, but if they mate right after they breed, there's three months there that it won't line up. So they have they basically pause the implantation of the embryo for three months and then it starts you know after that three months and then nine months gestation so they're back um to give birth at the same time each year Got it. um the bulls will display with i love this glaring posturing and fighting i've never seen glaring in a description for behavior That's like that before like, i'm going to glare at you which i mean makes sense he looks scary <laughs> um and again they do those to get those territories so they have uh, i saw somewhere like seven to ten or more females that they will mate with and defend um because they are males will mate with as many females as they can that's their kind of strategy um so they have a long time nursing this is different than a lot of the other seals that we've talked about um where they give you know they give birth and they nurse for a few days to a month or something like that these guys will nurse for 300 days sometimes even into the second year yeah like wow it's an investment. That's a that's a big investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was kind of odd. I don't most seals and sea lions you don't have that long of a of a nursing yeah. period. Huh. Um, so the females will take foraging trips that range from one to twenty days at sea with a, a um and then will come back and have an attendance period of one to two days where they nurse the pup. So they nurse, go to sea to eat, come back, nurse, separate. Um, the foraging trips will increase in length as the pup gets older and is able to be on its own more. Um, when the females come back, they have high-pitched screech calls where they call to their pup and then the pups call back, but there may be multiple pups calling back. And so they kind of go back and forth until the, the right pair matches up. <laughs> Which I thought was kind so of cool. would be a fun thing to see. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like the penguins, like the yep. emperor penguins where they can call and recognize their own call. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then they go up and they like touch noses and then it's like, and the pup's all like, yay, it's you, mom. It's so exciting. Um, and then, uh, so the the pups will feed on solid food before weaning. weaning. So again, because it's 300, you know, it's almost a year that they're um, that they're uh, nursing. So they'll start practicing in, in feeding uh, on their own. Um, they'll play with other pups and they call them pup pods, which I love. Love it. <laughs> Isn't that great? So they That's get in little pup pods that stay close to where they're born, you know, not too far away, but they all like get together. Cause you think about like all the, like a lot of the females are gone. So the pups are just there. Like, oh, what do we do? Getting into trouble. So they'll play with other pups. They'll play with objects like seaweed and other reef fish. Um, and we've talked about this before, but that's, you know, the juvenile time and that young times when they're learning behaviors that they're going to need for finding food, socializing, all the things that they'll need in life. So it's a really important time. Um, some of them will gather in pods and go inland while the moms feed. So uh, in uh, at the Oahu waterfall and stream near Kaikoura in Northeast North Island, they will play in the pool at the base of the waterfall and climb on rocks and go into the forest to explore. That's which I, so cool. Right, you imagine like walking around in the forest and being like this waterfall and all of a sudden it's like fur seals just like, hey, what's up? <laughs> like, what are you doing? Um, so the pups will voluntarily go into the water at about two months of age, which I love that they put voluntarily because other times if they get washed in earlier, they're, they, they, they die. It's not good. Um, so it takes them a little bit to, before they're ready to do that. Um, and then in the spring, most pups are weaned, um, and dispersed uh, and they disperse out. Juveniles have been seen over a thousand kilometers away from their place of birth. So they're like, that's it, mom. I'm gone. See you later. And they yeah. check it. Um, and they will assemble in large colonies. So they have these large juvenile colonies at different places. And again, this is, you'll, you'll they'll see them posturing and fighting and, you know, the kind of the play fight. And they're like, ah, oh, this is what we do when we're going to fight. And then we're tired. We're going to go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's probably another very important time for them to, um, to play and to, to learn those behaviors that they'll need, especially males for, having to uh, defend their territories so so that's basically it that's what we know behaviorally is they feed and they reproduce that's pretty much what i could find <laughs> um so with that um we will take a quick break and then we'll come back with the threats and then some fun current research that i found so we'll be back in just a minute
All right, and we're back. Thanks for coming back with us. Um, so, Kat, let's get into the the sadder part of the story before we move on from from that. Yeah. So, currently, the population estimate for New Zealand fur seals is around about two hundred thousand and increasing. Um, this was estimated at about fifty thousand in like nineteen ninety four ish, with a further five thousand in Australia, and so now we can see that like population is considerably increased even from our estimates in like the early 1990s. Um, so just the last like 10 to 20 years. The highest rate of local population increase was recorded at Kangaroo Island in Australia with a greater than 12% increase per annum. Um, wow, that's huge. I mean, you're yeah, like, this, like it's two or 3%. That's a good increase, like 12. Yeah, is this one specifically, the, the website that I found said that this was thought to be due to a delayed population recovery after um, 70 years of harvesting stopped. Um, and so th this is kind of a delayed resurgence basically in this specific area, right. but basically just does go to show that the populations are rebounding very, very well after significant decline, which we'll get to in just a second. <laughs> Being decimated. Um, right. Yeah. And because of all of that, they are currently listed by the IUCN as a species of least concern because they mm -hmm. are actually doing very, very well. So getting into the threats, um, historically, the biggest threat for New Zealand fur seals was hunting. So these guys were massively targeted by hunters and sealers um, by the end of the 19th century. So that's like the, the 1800s, mm -hmm. um, end of the 1800s, they had almost been hunted to extinction. And it was thought that prior to this intense hunting effort, they were in the millions in terms of their populations. Oh, wow. Um, obviously, we don't necessarily have good population counts, but just given how many animals were being taken from the population, it seems like they were likely um, numbering into the millions. So they were first targeted by the Polynesian settlers in New Zealand, and then more intensively after that by the European hunters who, who came to the area. Um, one report, I love this, I thought this was so fascinating, one report from 1805 claimed uh, 60,000 skins of New Zealand fur seals had been taken. And that was surpassed by one from 1814 to 1815, which quoted two, uh, sorry, 400,000 skins taken over mm. a two year period. Oh my God. And that's just in one region, one place. right? It's just yeah. one area. Um, wow. So again, these populations were absolutely decimated. There were a couple of things that I saw that suggested that there's been some, some conversation around whether or not the specific species of New Zealand fur seal that we see today was the one that was actually being targeted in all of these reports. There's some mm. thought that perhaps they were including other species of fur seal in the area in that kind of lumping them all together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a couple of other species that are known to have been in the area that had slightly more lustrous skins and furs. So there, there's some thought that perhaps it wasn't all just the New the Zealand species. fur seal that we see today, right. but regardless, of what happened there were the population was basically very very much decimated for right. um almost a century and these low numbers were were um kind of in place until the 20th century um and that was really only when the hunting effort started to diminish a little bit hmm. today there is um you know active hunting of these animals is illegal they are protected by the marine mammal protection act and several conservation acts in the region um but that was really traditionally the biggest threat to these animals since that, moving into current day, mm -hmm. human interaction is still the biggest threat. So it's just in a slightly different way. Like we talked about, because their numbers are, I love it, one report that I read that blooming, and I thought that was amazing. Blooming? Like, that's a perfect word for this, where it's like, they really are like, they are just doing so well again after such a, a period of decline. They're more and more likely to interact with people as people mm -hmm. are are moving more and more into the coastal regions, as New Zealand itself and, and Australia is becoming more and more populated, just like everywhere else. These two are basically converging. Um, and unfortunately, that convergence is not always positive. Mm -hmm. um, so in a positive way, this has actually led to a lot of increased tourism in the area, which is fantastic. So obviously, that's a big economic gain. Um, there's a lot of, especially on the South Island of New Zealand, there's a lot of um, nature tours and things like that that you can go on. That's a big part of their economy down there, whale watching, dolphin watching. Um, and this has kind of become part of that process. Yes. Yeah. I have, well, I, I have a, a specific um, in the new research that fits right in with that if you want. Oh, to perfect. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So we'll get to so talk about that more. They actually have swimming with seals programs, right? <laughs> 
that's what okay, I said. What I'm about to say makes that seem like not a very good idea. Okay, good. So I'll talk about this and you tell me about that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so yes. they, I, I, I had the same face. I was like, I don't seriously see, I'm not sure. That's not, okay. Um, but in 2014, there was an article looking at the sustainability about it, um, for it. And this is the Bay of Plenty, which is apparently a, a more recent um, uh, breeding colony. Um, and so they looked at what the, you know, the, the, how the tour operators were, how the seals were, you know, that kind of stuff. And they said the seals mostly ignored the swimmers. 54% of them were like, meh, you're weird. Okay, whatever. Some interacted. So about 41% actually interacted with them. And rarely did they avoid swimmers. Uh, so that was 41% that interacted and then 5% that avoided them. So they really didn't seem to mind um, again, mostly during December, corresponding with the pupping season, which means that these are most likely juveniles because they're excluded from the breeding colonies. And so you don't have the males and females there. You have these juveniles that are more likely to interact in the first place. Um, so they said it's likely sustainable um, as the regulators, the, the tour operators were good and the seals did not seem to mind. So... Okay, that was my question though, because you said breeding colony initially and I'm like, if they're taking them to breeding colonies, that's a terrible Oh no, that's dumb. They should yeah. not be doing that. <laughs> no, no, mom's going to... That be makes more sense. Real, yeah, okay. no, the males and the females are not going to be good to be, but the juveniles apparently seem to be okay. Just one yeah, no, that makes sense. You know, they're, they're again, like all, all seal species, uh, you know, True seals or odoriads are very curious, so right. that does that does make more sense. Um, but that's really interesting. So again, so right, so this can be a big economic thing, right? That's a really right. positive thing for the economy. It's again, especially with marine mammal tourism, that's a lot of educational stuff happening through that, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. A lot of um, it's a great kind of captive audience to share how to appropriately interact with animals and all that kind of stuff. However. I did find a really interesting newspaper article from January 2022, so just mm. last year, um, talking about the massive increase they've seen in New Zealand fur seal populations in New Zealand and how this is actually becoming quite an issue. And it really mirrors a lot of what we're seeing here in Washington right now in the conversation around seals and sea lions eating salmon. Mm -hmm. So harming a seal is still a criminal offense in New Zealand. So you can get um, up to two years in prison or a fine of $250,000 if you're caught. But over the last few years, they've been seeing more and more instances of seals being targeted, fur seals being targeted for sport, or uh -huh. as I, I quote from the article, in disturbing killing sprees. So it seems that like people are literally going after them and trying to take out as many as they can in certain locations. Wow. Um, and so in this article, again, it's this is from the, the, the New Zealand Guardian. Um, so in December of 2021, it would have been the Department of Conservation actually found 19 seals dead at a specific lookout spot, at mm. least nine of which they had determined had been recently shot. Mm. Um, in 2010, two men who were working on a salmon farm were, were charged with clubbing 23 seals to death. These are all talking about New Zealand fur seals. Right. Um, and the men who were found guilty had argued that the seals were pests and had been depleting their fish stocks. Mm. So again it's very similar to the conversation we're seeing here in washington right now with you know people arguing that the seals and the sea lions are depleting the salmon populations which are mm -hmm. the main food for the southern resident killer whales here in this area and you know also a big fishery in the pacific northwest and it's very similar so basically just this is kind of an, an ongoing concern and issue that as we see these growing population rates there's more and more encroachment with these two populations of people and fur seals meeting and that's not mm -hmm. always Good. positive and the fur seals yeah. themselves can be very aggressive so there is also concern if there's housing areas that are close mm -hmm. to breeding colonies for example obviously people are told not to go near them but i mean especially if you're little kids or people are just right. curious and they don't do what they're told um there is a high risk of of negative interaction with the seals potentially attacking people or biting people or dogs or small animals that kind of thing yeah, I mean, in anywhere that you have wildlife encroaching on where people are, as we met, are going to continue as we expand and they expand, there's going to be those crossovers. And that's why education is so important, but it's just you can't reach everybody for everything. So, you know, it's 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 difficult. Well, you can't reach everyone and different people have different vested interests, right. too. So even when you can reach them again, if you're a fisherman and you feel like these animals are taking your livelihood, it's, Even yeah. if you've been educated on the fact that they're, you know, they're, they're protected, blah, blah, blah. Like it, you're still going to potentially right. not, ignore, you're going to ignore that. Right. <laughs> so um, the only other threat that I wanted to talk about is again, another human related one, which is entanglement. So again, with this proximity to humans, proximity to fisheries, 
New Zealand fur seals are at a high risk of entanglement, especially because they are also a coastal species, which I know we've talked about before. Um, this is where a lot of bycatch happens is in the coastal area where you just get trash, you know, being thrown yeah. around. And um, they're especially at risk of bycatch in long line and trawling fisheries. Mm. Um, and they've been found entangled in, in lots of different types of marine debris, including packing tape, which was one which I saw, which is mm. kind of really sad. Um, loops, which I think are the, again, like the little can, um, plastic can loops oh. and things like that, that they can get stuck on their neck or things like that, right. or just fragments of fishing, fishing gear, um, that's broken off or that's just loose in water that's fallen off the, the fishing boat. So lots of human related, uh, threats to these guys, which is, mm -hmm. um, unfortunate, but also in a way kind of positive in that we, we have the ability to mitigate that, right. um, if we choose to. So not quite as dire as some of the other ones that we've talked about yeah but these guys are actually having a large population and <laughs> yeah but yeah, that also means more concerned. of them will be interacting with human things as well yeah so with that let's get into the new research and then we'll kind of conclude with a couple fun facts yes um so i'm gonna go with my two, two stories that are about kind of uh, threats uh so uh, adding on to the human related threat uh is toxoplasmosis so in 2014 they had the first documented case of toxoplasmosis in a seal from Australian waters. And this was a, a New Zealand fur seal. Um, and it did show that they had active disease. So it wasn't just like, well, they found it, but it wasn't didn't do anything to them. It did produce active disease. So they, the juvenile seal had non-supportive men, meningo, meningoencephalitis, hypophysitis, posterior uvitis, retrobulbar cellulitis, and myocarditis. Associated with so basically cortisone basically everything system. was inflamed is what they're yes. saying. <laughs> the itis, 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 itis means inflamed, inflamed, inflamed. So your heart was inflamed, whatever the retro bulbar is. <laughs> um, men, you know, your, you know, the meningeal stuff and encephalitis in the brain. So it was not good. Um, and the seal was emaciated and more brown when it beached. Wow. Um, they found that the T, the, so the, uh, just for a brief explanation, the toxoplasmosis comes from a, a from T. gondii. Um, which is found in poop of cats, basically. Um, and so with large colonies of feral cats that you have, cats are just sort of out, you know, not in the house, they're out and around, that poop goes there and then it gets into many different places. Um, and for example, Hawaiian monk seals, it's really a, a big issue for them. Um, and we're finding it in more and more places as there are more and more feral cats that are wandering around. Um, so these oocytes, the eggs basically, um, originated from the mainland Australia, where there are lots of feral cats, um, and so that they're recognizing that they may act, that may act as a disease threat to native fauna. Um, and so it's interesting that they also saw emerging taxoplasmosis in the Arctic. So they're saying it's the same thing as mirroring in the Antarctic, in the Southern Ocean, with unknown effects to to Antarctica in particular. But it's it's basically here. It's there. So. Um, so something to be watching out for and um, dealing with. So um, toxoplasmosis is, is, you'll see it come up for marine mammals, mostly with pinnipeds that you'll see because they're more in in areas where they'll overlap with where cat poop might be. Right. Um, the other one uh, is only, this was one where basically they found a virus and that's all they were saying in the paper is like, we found this virus. And the rest of it was like gobbledygook. I'm like, I don't understand anything you just said. So basically it was in 2013, um, they found a circular DNA virus that is a novel virus from the fecal matter of New Zealand fur seals. So novel meaning if it's a new virus they'd never seen before. Um, and they had similar sequences, DNA sequences to Giardia intestinalis genome. So it could be something similar to Giardia, which if it's going to affect, if it you know possibly mutated so now it's a kind of version of that that could affect those seals, that could be another emerging disease that could be popping up. So, um, and I guess it makes sense as the population grows and there's like nature is going to find ways to try to <laughs> mitigate the population. So as that happens, more of these things are probably going to start popping up as diseases. And, and, and as they share and are interacting with more and more seals, there's, that's going to transmit more. So, um, so then the, uh, everything else, so there wasn't a lot of recent stuff. Everything is like 1970s, 1990s, early 2000s. I did find a few papers from the early, um, early to mid, no, mid to starting to become closer to us <laughs> in time papers, um, but they're almost all of them were by the same author, um, lead author. So I think that must be like a main researcher that was doing 
uh, stuff at that time. So the first two here are from 2008, and basically it's back to when they're what they're eating and and reproduction. So uh, one study looked that there were um, lactating females shift their foraging location from the shelf, uh, continental shelf, to the oceanic waters in response to a se probably a seasonal decline in productivity. So you're going to stay on the shelf as long as there's good food, and then you're going to move offshore if you need if you need to. Um, and so they use two regions, one that's seasonally productive nearby upwelling area. So the upwelling areas are very important for the productivity and particularly for these, these seals. Um, and then a more distant permanent oceanic front that is, I guess, more, more regular. So like you're gonna go to the continental shelf because when, when you can, because it's easier to get there and it's not that far. But when that's not going, you know that there's a permanent place that you can go, it's just farther away. Gotcha. Um, so with, uh, along those lines, and again, the same, same lead author, uh, they found that there are colony specific foraging crowns, um, but those are mainly the ones that are, um, in the continental shelf. So you're the, the creation of a foraging grounds where these where certain colonies go specifically to those is influenced by how close the colonies are to the predictable local upwelling features. So if they have one close, that, that colony is going to have a foraging ground that is common to them versus those distant oceanic frontal zones. Um, again, same author. Uh, there was high foraging site fidelity for females foraging on the continental shelf compared to oceanic. So again, having that site fidelity, but this is looking particularly at females. Um, and again, that may reflect that concentration of productivity with that coastal upwelling system versus the oceanic one that is more dispersed and less predictable, but permanent, if that makes sense. Uh, less predictable at fine scales. So you know that if you go out to that front, there's going to be food out there, but it's going to be more dispersed versus concentrated in these particular um, upwelling places close to shore. Um, uh, then the uh, relating to human interaction, and the swimming with program we talked about, there was another study in 2015 that looked at the um, disturbance of vessels, um, what that looks like. And so first sales became disturbed when the vessels approached to the 10 to 20 meter distance category. And this again was in that Bay of Plenty, the same one where the swim with study was done. Um, and, but the response varied with month, time of day, duration of vessel exposure and distance to the vessel, also with age, sex, and number of seals present. So a lot of variability but they did show that there was a, a distance where they were more likely to be dis disturbed. And so they, they had set, I think, a meter of like, everybody should stay away 50 meters from the seals. So it was a study looking at what's the, you know, with the orcas here, we have, you know, 200 meters that you're supposed to stay away or whatever. Finding that distance that is the best that you can get close enough to view them if you want to do tourism, but you're not disturbing. Okay. Um, so that, 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 okay. So then the last one I have is about, uh, the, um, the genetics. And so there we're talking about hybrids. So in, um, there are in one place, um, and this is a study in 2007 at Macquarie Island, Macquarie, Macquarie. Macquarie Island. Yeah. yeah. Macquarie Island. There is, a, a, a form, a recently formed fur seal population, um, that's both of both sexes of breeding Antarctic and sub-Antarctic fur seals, and in, uh, another collection of male New Zealand fur seals that are there. Um, and these Ooh. are presumed to be non-breeders due to their absence from the principal breeding areas. However, they looked at the study and examined the source of the involvement of the New Zealand fur seals, um, and 95 or 10% of the pups born from 1992 to 2003 were genetically identified as New Zealand hybrids. So those males are mating with other the other the Antarctic and subantarctic fur seal species. How interesting. Mm-hmm. And it said most resulted from the reproduction within the territories by the New Zealand hybrids of both sexes, so both male and female hybrids. Um, some were conceived extraterritorially, uh, indicating that the males successfully utilized strategies other than territory holding to achieve fraternities. So the males that are out there not necessarily holding holding the females in, you know, in a territory, they possibly mating with them somewhere else. Wow. Which is interesting. Very really opposite cool. of what they normally do. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the female reproductive status influenced mating partner and mating location and females without pups were more likely to conceive extraterritorially with the New Zealand fur seal males. So depending on, you know, basically 
what's happening with the female, what she's doing, how she's going, um, and uh, where they are would influence how they're going to reproduce. But very interesting, first, that there's hybrids between these species, which goes back to what you're talking about before, like, you know, are, are they all separate? Where, where does that genetics overlap? How much of these hybrids we going back into each population? Um, where does the species end? Uh, and then also when you're talking about the threats, you know, who was taking who back in the day, were they all first, you know, Antarctic fur seals or sub-Antarctic or New Zealand fur seals? Um, maybe some of both because there may have been hybridization happening at that point too. Um, so just kind of interesting and that they can utilize a very different reproductive strategy than they normally do. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. So that's what I have for um, the new research. <laughs> it's not exactly like right now, but um, more, more recent. Um, so why don't you do the, the fun facts of the names? Because that's always fun. First. Yeah. So these guys, the their Latin name is Arctocephalus fosteri. And that means, uh, so Arcto meaning bear and cephaly mm. meaning head. So bear headed. And I couldn't get definitive on the fosteri. I know that there was a, um, a foster who was a naturalist on Captain Cook's vessel and he was um responsible for naming um the, you know gave his name to several latin names in the antarctic area and that region so i'm assuming this is related to james foster the naturalist would make sense well yeah but i couldn't get 100 hmm. percent definition on that so we're just going to go with bareheaded being the uh, arctocephalus which is pretty I like it. <laughs> um these guys have tons of common names so new zealand fur seal is the most common one obviously they're also known as the australasian fur seal the south australian fur seal the antipodian fur seal the long nose fur seal and in the maori language they are known as kakeno like meaning look arounds which i thought was adorable because apparently they're they're mm. really they're when they're on land they're constantly looking around which again make also like even if that's a learned behavior, given how often they were hunted, kind of makes sense. Right? So they are known as Kakeno by the Maoris, which is pretty cool. That's why I kept seeing the Kakeno, but I, I specifically didn't look it up because I knew you were going to be talking about it. So I'm like, that's cool. Yeah. I'm learning what it is. Yeah. So yeah, means look around. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Which it like makes sense, but then also kind of sad. Glaring. Huh? It is kind of sad. But I thought it was funny when you were mentioning glaring, where I'm like, oh, these guys are just like very expressive, apparently, with their eyes. So yeah, they're either was... glaring or looking around to make sure they don't get eaten. Right. <laughs> Known for their things. their eye contact. Yeah. That's, kind of... <laughs> That's cool. Um, yeah. so we want to end on a really funny story that I actually um this was in uh, 2022, so summer of 2022, and I actually saw this and I, I texted it to the rest of our Pac-Man team. I was like, oh my god, look at this, this is ridiculous. So a baby New Zealand fur seal broke into a marine biologist's home, family home in New Zealand. Um, but what's really ironic is that the marine biologist wasn't there. It was, he missed it. And I'm like, that would have been me. It would have broken into my home and been gone by the time I got back. Like, not cool, man. Um, <laughs> but it seemed, apparently it managed to get into the house through one of the cat doors. Yep. Um, and uh, according to Ross, the, fa the family cat seemingly provoked the animal. It's like, come Which on. Is come understandable on. if you know cats. <laughs> right? Um, and Ross said that his wife was able to encourage the seal out of the house and into the garden. Um, and then she called the Department of Conservation Ranger to get the baby for a seal to a safe place. So, again, that encroachment of human and people. And obviously, remember the juveniles, we talked about those ones going up the waterfall and going into the forest to, to explore. So, explore, yeah. Not not really surprising um, and that these are so expressive and they look out everywhere they're going to be like that's an interesting thing what are you little cat let me go through the door and find yeah. this wonderful home well can you imagine walking into your house or, or like coming i think she was upstairs when i came downstairs and was like there's a there's a seal in the living room right where he's looking around for a hidden count you're like wait a minute am i being are we bring pranks am i being like, caught on camera right now like wait a second well, especially with the marine biologist, I just thought about this with the marine biologist's husband. Maybe he's a big prankster and like was able to like, you know, do something funny, you know, like, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I thought that was a, a very f funny story, although it does tell you like, again, we're, there's a lot of interaction and encroachment. And so that can be a problem, but at least this one had a good, good ending, didn't get hurt. He's able to get back out the cat door and they were able to take it back to where it, where he should be. So able to uh, just yeah. be a funny funny story to share thankfully yeah well and then you imagine the, the pup going back he's like oh my god you guys would not you, you have no idea what i just went through 
<laughs> well, there's a really cool place and there's this really weird thing and it had a tail and I don't know what's going on. Imagine explaining that to your others, your, your pup pod, you know, as you go back to. <laughs> <laughs> so that is it for the New Zealand fur seal. Um, it, this was a fun one to, to research as they all are, but um, uh, we hope you enjoyed it and make sure that you remember you can subscribe to the podcast uh, and that gives you ad free episodes as well as um, fun mini episodes um, each month to uh, with updates on from the field and other random things we want to talk about and share with you. Um, so subscribe to that if you can and share with others. Uh, go ahead and look at our, our Facebook and Instagram uh, for the next next month. We'll have another Marine Mammal Highlight and of course have the po the the, um, the poll up there for you guys to choose. And also visit our website and we have some awesome new merch. Uh, that you can grab and uh, that is super fun with our new logos and new not new logo but new what's designs. Not fun? design there we go thank you um, new designs uh, and new products so check those out and all the funds whether you're subscribing or the um, uh, the merch all the funds go back to helping us continue our research and educational stuff like this to share with you so with that um, we will see you next time bye This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P A C M A M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks.